Hello friends, I'm Ashish Sarbari, founder and CEO of Axiomize. To our new listeners, welcome. And to our old listeners, welcome back. Thank you for your interest. So in the previous podcast, I talked about test and verification challenges for system on chip, and I covered in detail test and verification strategies that are used for uh, designing and verifying um, IPs and SOCs. So in terms of design architecture and computing, we have really gone from room size mainframes in the 1960s to today's pocket size mobile compute machines running at gigahertz with tons of on-chip memory. Our interactions with these machines have redefined who we are and they continue to do this. By contrast, as I was explaining in the previous podcast, the test and verification techniques are grounded in simulation, which is still the main workhorse of verification and its bigger cousin emulation. And the core strength of these techniques is in being able to scale these to bigger IP blocks and bigger uh, subsystems and full system on chip. However, to be able to cope with the increasing time to market challenges and the complexity that comes from design, uh, not just functional, but safety, security, and low power, the space of input stimulus that needs to be covered is growing not just bigger, but the interaction is becoming more complex. So just simulation-based verification alone will not actually help. So what we need to do is to think a little differently. And in this podcast today, I'm going to talk about formal verification. In particular, I would like to discuss what is formal verification. I want to touch upon a brief history of formal. And I would also like to point out why it has had a difficult checkered adoption and how we can actually make it easier for you to learn formal. So Dijkstra famously coined the phrase, testing shows the presence, not the absence of bugs. So in April of 1970, he challenged the design community to think differently. Even though the remark that he made was in the context of software verification, Dijkstra's call to action has had much wider influence. Dijkstra was not alone in making this observation. There was a quiet revolution that was happening in the US and the UK that could be traced back to the 1950s. So I'm right now talking about the modern roots of formal verification. The more historical context of formal could be dated back to several thousands of years, and it goes back to the observation that logic was being used by philosophers to describe ways of making things more precise. So for example, Socrates said, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, and therefore he's a mortal. So as much as logic and philosophy were intertwined, and they were being discussed in that context, the way we perceive formal verification today, I think it's fair to say that its history can be traced back to about late 1950s. So going back to, 1950s. In 1954, Martin Davis developed the first computer-generated mathematical proof for a theorem for a decidable fragment of what is also called first-order logic. Uh, you might, if you're new to formal and new to this kind of, uh, of a framework, uh, in, in formal methods and in logic, there are lots of different mathematical logics, so propositional Boolean logic, first-order logic, higher-order logic, temporal logic. So this was actually a first-order logic And the idea here was to prove a theorem about some arithmetic properties of numbers. The actual theorem was that the product of two even numbers is even. You might wonder why you would like to do this in the first place. But actually, this is what triggered a lot of people to look at proofs as a way um, to mechanically actually prove things to see whether they can actually um, get machines to do the proof. The concept of a proof and mathematicians doing the proof is is very old. So in the late 1960s, first order order theorem provers were applied uh, to the problem of verifying the correctness of computer programs written in languages such as Pascal, Ada, and Java. Notable among such verification systems was the Stanford Pascal verifier. It was developed by David Luckham at Stanford University and was based on the Stanford Resolution Prover developed using Allen Robinson's resolution principle. In 70s in Edinburgh, in Scotland, 
Boyer and Moore were building their first machine-based prover, and they built it in 1972 called NQTHM. And that became the basis for ACL2, which is one of the most well-known theorem provers today. And it could prove mathematical theorems automatically for logic based on a dialect of pure Lisp, uh, which is a functional programming language. And almost at the same time, so Robin Milner built the original LCF, uh, Logic for Computable Function System, for proof checking at Stanford University. Descendants of LCF now make up a thriving family of theorem provers, the most famous ones being Hall 4, uh, Quark, uh, and Isabel. So Hall was built by Mike Gordon and Tom Hellum. Um, Hall Light was built by John Harrison. Cork was built largely at Inri in France, uh, drawing on the original work done by Gerard Huet and Thierry Coquin. Both ACL2 and the various provers such as Hall 4 and Hall Light have been used extensively for digital verification of floating point units. Some of the earliest foundational work on this was done by scientists at AMD and Intel. In fact, John Harrison, Joseph Urban, and Freak Wyke have written a very nice article covering the history of interactive theorem proving, if you're interested to read that. Another notable theorem prover that is not considered part of the LCF family is PVS. It was developed by Sam Ori, John Rushby, and Rajan Shankar at SRI, and has been used extensively during the verification of safety critical systems, especially on space-related work at NASA. So theorem provers have long been proved valuable the problem is they cannot produce counterexamples. You model a system based on precise mathematical logic rules. You apply inference rules to deduce new properties of the system. You may find that you, to, in order to prove that something holds of the system, you may have to add more lemmas and theorems, but you can't get any feedback. On the other hand, theorem provers don't suffer from any state space explosion problem. And here is where another form of formal methods comes handy, which is called model checking, which has its root in a slightly different way of looking at it. So it's also a mathematical and uh, mathematical technique to verify systems, uh, but it uses a very different way of solving the problem. What it does is it actually models the whole system um, and encodes it in a state space sense and actually uses searched algorithms to walk through the state space to find out if a given property holds on all the states of the system. At a very high level, this is what all model checkers tend to do. It's called a model checker because you're verifying a model of a system. It's also called property checking these days because people use properties or assertions to uh, write down what they would like to verify. So when I say model checking, assertion-based verification, property checking, they're all the same thing. The earliest roots of model checking um, could be traced back to Alan Emerson and Ed Clark at Carnegie Mellon University in the US and Joseph Sifakis' group in France. And um, at the same time when these two groups were working on algorithms to formally verify state space formalisms of the systems, Amir Puneli Wiki and Lamport were working on describing properties um, and languages and logics that can be used to describe properties. So temporal logic, which is a way to describe time-based behavior in a logically, mathematically precise way, was being developed by Lamport and Pinelli. And in fact, if you're familiar with system embedded log assertions or PSL, uh, they all have roots in LTL, linear temporal logic, or CTL, computation tree logic dating back to the work of Pinelli and Lamport. And in 1981, you know, Clark actually combined the state space exploration approach with temporal logic in a way that provided the first automated model checking algorithm. And in the mid eighties, several optimizations of these algorithms were being done. And suddenly Randy Bryant at CMU had invented BDD, a binary decision diagram, canonical formalism to model the Boolean formulas. And what Ken McMillan, a graduate student uh, at the time working with Ed Clark did, was to take these BDDs and apply this on the state space explosion, uh, state space exploration problem um, solution of, of Ed Clark and symbolic model checking was born. So this was a game changing moment in the field of formal methods because we had an automatic, somewhat scalable algorithm 
to verify systems efficiently. A lot of advanced research based on BDDs and later on SAT solvers happened after that, but formal has always struggled to gain the status of the first class citizen in most industries, in hardware design and verification, also in software. And one of the reasons I can think of is because a lot of the early research and work was done by mathematically inclined uh, computer scientists um, using very precise mathematical notations and not everybody who was the end user was actually well trained to absorb it and receive it. Um, it used to be called that you need a PhD in informal verification to be able to use formal. And to a large extent, this propagated the industry keeping a lot of interested end customer away from formal. Uh, this was not great news. But you know what, in the last two decades, significant advancements happened in the tool space when the big three EDA vendors, um, uh, Cadence Synopsys and Mentor Graphics and One Spin Solutions um, and Jasper, which was at the time independent in about um, thinking of early 2000s, mid 2000s, they basically developed this idea of automated solutions that can actually solve problems that engineers cared about and they were wrapping the core of mathematics and algorithms under the hood so the end user doesn't have to care about it. A classic example of this is equivalence checking. When you take a Verilog or a VHDL design and you want to prove that the synthesized design is equal to the net list, a lot of users of equivalence checking uh, solutions don't actually even know that it is based on a formal algorithm under the hood. It was a very good example. And in fact, these apps, as they were to be called, um, continued to increase the user base. But what sadly did not happen enough of was the use of property checking to find functional issues in the design. So simulation continues to dominate that space. And one of the main reasons why it does that is there's a lack of methodology. Uh, there's There's been no clear um, progress made in making methodology easier for the end user. So one of the things we do at Axiomize is to teach methodology, problem solving techniques that make it easier for the end customer, you the designer and the verification engineer to use formal productively. So we've had a lot of success in being able to transform this complex body of knowledge, um, take it from the historical masters and transform this into a very simple accessible form format. So you can actually learn this in a short amount of time three to four days and become productive with it. So if you want to make formal easier, come and talk to us. We are here to make it easier for you. We are here to make a difference. We like to simplify the complex mathematics, but we don't take away anything from it. We actually give you all of the cool tips and tricks. You'll be pleased to know that modern day property checking is capable of verifying designs as big as 1 billion gates. Yes, you heard me right, 338 million flops, compiled and actually verified exhaustively with formal verification. So we will continue to explore this topic in more depth in the coming weeks, uh, but I hope you like today's podcast. And uh, if you like it, stay in touch. Let us know questions, feedbacks at info at xmis.com and feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, looking forward to staying in touch with you. Stay fit, stay safe.